Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of Ezra 8.22, and so this is going to be a lot of reading for our context. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. This is New Testament speech here. The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him. But his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. Very interesting. We hear that same thing in the New Testament. Um, and it finishes. But his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. Okay, so we had the whole verse there. Okay, let's go up here. Actually, these three are standalone. Let's see. No, actually, it does change context right here. Yeah. So it may only be these three. Let's start here in verse 21. Fasting and prayer for protection. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road. Because we had spoken to our king, saying, The hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayer. And then he jumps into something else. So we'll just use those three for our context of what they were doing here. A convoy on many accounts would have been desirable for the pilgrim band, but a holy shamefacedness would not allow Ezra to seek one. He feared lest the heathen king should think his professions of faith in God to be mere hypocrisy or imagine that the God of Israel was not able to preserve his own worshipers. He could not bring his mind to lean on an arm of flesh in a matter so evidently of the Lord, and therefore the caravan set out with no visible protection, guarded by him who is the sword and shield of his people. Remember when I tell you I see a sword coming and his name is Jesus Christ? Here we go. Even those who in a measure walk by faith occasionally mar the luster of their life by craving aid from man. And we've all been in this place. Well, now's the time for us to change that. We've all been in this place where we had to seek out the help of man in order to accomplish even, even little things. Well, sometimes it's okay to ask for a little help on menial things, but you know what? You don't have to every time for even medium stuff or big stuff or even some small stuff. Ask the Lord and treat the Lord first. See what he has to say. See what he'll do. Most likely, he's going to be the one that's going to bless you in that. It's part of walking in faith. It is a most blessed thing to have no props and no buttresses, but to stand upright on the rock of ages, upheld by the Lord alone. And before anybody starts, you know, gets those thoughts in their head, well, so I can ask man about the little stuff, but only God only about the big stuff. You can ask man, God about the little stuff too. You need help loading a lawnmower up in the back of a truck to take it somewhere. And you're the only person and you don't have any help. The Lord will give you strength to do it. I kid you not. He's done it with me many times. When I didn't have the strength, he gave me the strength, physical strength. When I didn't have the spiritual strength, he gave me the spiritual strength. Small things, big things, everything in between. Would any believers seek state endowments for their church? 501c3, anyone? I'm telling you. The 501c3 wasn't a recent invention. When Constantine figured out he couldn't defeat the church, he said, okay, cool, I'm going to bring the church under state protection. We'll put them under, under state government. That was the first implication of 501c3 because he made it so they couldn't pay taxes. So they didn't have to pay taxes. He was buttering them up. And boy, Satan's plan worked. Would any believer seek state endowments for their church if they remember that the Lord is dishonored by their asking Caesar's aid? 
if churches knew this, if they read the in in context, let me let me help you understand something here. A lot of people don't realize this. 501c3 is a tax shelter. <coughs> no, but it's just the stuff that goes on the, you know, you know how you can funnel stuff over to the church. I'm gonna give a big donation. I I heard a pastor one time. Everything the, the church property was on his property. Basically, it was enclosed within his property. He designated a certain spot. So he was able to do a transaction with that and then 501c3 that. Now, anything involving the road leading to, which is also his driveway to his house, the road leading to, and everything where that building sat and everything on that little chunk of property was all under this 501c3. Well, this was also within his actual property. And he made comments, yeah, we're going to give a big donation to the church. Well, just so happened it was in the fall, right around when the fiscal year flipped, which is when the 501c3 would kick in in its greatest amount, making that big donation and then funnel off little bits for other stuff. You don't have to pay taxes on that. You can hide money in your church. Why do you think so many of these charismatics are so rich? It's not just because of donations. It's because of illegitimate business dealings that the Lord does not approve of using the 501c3. See, they can hold all of their fortunes within the church and not have to pay anything on it. Well, the church bought me my house. Well, the church bought me my cars. Well, the church paid for this. The church paid for that. Now I don't have to pay taxes. They're hiding under 501c3. This is what he's getting at here. Wouldn't the Lord give us what we need if we have a church? Sure. Wouldn't the Lord provide us what we need if we're running a ministry? Sure. Absolutely he will. A church building doesn't need a 501c3. The Lord will provide. And the particular pastor I was mentioning, the Lord did provide. The Lord did show him where everything fell apart. And it's still going weird. Because we rely too much on the state. We rely too much on the world. As if the Lord could not supply the needs of his own cause. When I lived in Oklahoma, years and years and years and years and years ago, I was a kid. Up near Tulsa, one of those neighborhoods. There was a church there. The summer was pretty warm. And there were people that didn't have AC. And so the pastor of a local church decided, I'm going to take what I've got and he, he, everything he had. He goes, I'm going to go and I'm going to buy fans and I'm going to give them out. They made him go back to each house and take the fans back. And then they find him. And I forget what it was because it was some weird, obscure regulation. But they made him do that. And it... it it wiped him out. He said, I'm quitting. He goes, I, I don't, I can't afford to keep the church open. I can't afford to pay the bills. I mean, there were times where he was doing service with no lights on because he couldn't afford it. It was just barely making it. And the Lord brought the people around to help him. And to keep him going. I don't believe, for, if I remember correctly, I don't believe he had a 501c3. I think he was trying to do it standalone. The Lord provided for him. I've seen a lot of churches where the Lord comes in at the, in the, at the last minute and provides everything. And it's amazing. It's amazing. He would rather us rely on him than rely on the world. And yet, what do we see most churches do? Rely on the world. Should we run so hastily to friends and relations for assistance if we remember that the Lord is magnified by our implicit reliance upon his solitary arm? This guy's quoting scripture. My soul, wait thou only upon God. But, says one, are not means to be used? Assuredly they are. But our fault seldom lies in their neglect. Far more frequently it springs out of foolishly believing in them instead of believing in God. It's okay to use the things, the means and that. It's okay to use that. But the problem is what's in our heart. We spend more time and more focus relying on those instead of relying on the God who provided those means. 
Few run too far in neglecting the creature's arm, but very many sin greatly in making too much of it. Learn, dear reader, to glorify the Lord by leaving means untried, if by using them thou wouldst dishonor the name of the Lord. And this is a place where you come to where you stop and you think about it. Okay. I We have this and this and this to go to. Should I use that? Should I go take out that loan to do this? Or should I wait and see what the Lord wants to do? I, I had an opportunity to take out a $20,000 loan, signature loan, no less. And I could have went and bought this little tractor with it. I waited. I said, nope. Because my wife was talking about it. I said, nope. Tear it up and throw it away. I don't want to get more in debt. The whole point is us paying off the debt. And we're, we're, we're doing that. We're paying off back and forth. We own our home now. It's paid off. I mean, we got almost everything taken care of. I told her, nope. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I put it up and petition him. I'm going to wait and see what he wants to do. He changed our financial situation, and now we're able to afford it, and we're able to get one. And it's been amazing. That little tractor has made it possible for us to do more stuff. We've done more in a year than we've done in eight years. Because it enables us to do an incredible amount of work. Far too often, we get in a hurry and we get impatient and we don't wait on the Lord. See, the Lord will change our situation to make stuff like that easier to accomplish. And do it by legitimate means instead of putting ourselves in, in a serious financial situations. Same thing goes with um, if we're doing things physically. Lord, do I need to go and hire people to help with this? Do I need to go and ask others to help with this? Or... Can I do this on my own? How should I do this? I have this coming up and it's, you know, I, I need to do this. What should I do? Wait on the Lord. And the Lord will give you the answer to that. He'll either send people to come help you or he'll give you the ability to do it yourself. Many people I know knew nothing about working on cars and stuff like that. Like, I don't know what I should do. And then they go to the Lord in prayer and then the Lord suddenly shows them an amazing thing and they end up doing stuff that they've never done before and have no problems with it. It goes super smooth. Of course, there's a whole lot of other people out there should not even be touching cars. <laughs> they do some terrible things to their vehicles. I remember Paul Harvey talking about a, uh, a, a couple, they were friends uh, two men built a house and they got to, they were old and they got to a point where their family and that talked them into letting other people do it. So they let other people do it to finish it. And so they came back and they're checking, checking it out, you know, and they found a gap in this uh, second portion that was added on after the fact. And so they drew that gap closed and realigned everything on that add on to match the rest of the house. So it was fixed. Both of those men were blind. See, the rest of the house was perfect. The part that the other people tried to finish didn't get done perfectly. And they could see these men did it blind. The Lord gave them the, the, the ability to do that. That's amazing. It's a great testament to the power of the Lord <laughs> and in his people when they act on faith. Now, there are times where you go and you, you pay for what you need to get. You go and you you find what needs to be done. You go and do it. But there's times where stuff pops up and it's like, whoa, this is a, a surprise. What should we do here? Since we bought our place, the power pole out there, the because this place was put up in like 1970 and this old trailer that's back here has been here that whole time. I'm about to tear it down and move it off. It can't be moved. It's too rickety. Um, been here since then. In fact, we got the property after the original owner died in it or he was the second owner. He died in the back bathroom and they had to, they had to cut the wall out to get him out. He was a big old boy, but, um, You can see where they had to take apart the walls and stuff just to get him out of the house. 
Um, but the breaker box was never up to code. And so it had a 75 amp breaker running the whole trailer. Well, for that little trailer, that was fine. This new one we have is 200 amps. So you couldn't run multiple pieces. You, if you were running the air conditioner, you could run the stove or the dryer or the hot water heater. Like if somebody took a shower, you had to wait till the hot water heater shut off to run the dryer or the washer. It would pop the breaker. Well, this last winter, we had a snowpocalypse down here in Texas because we had already been through three breakers because they overheat and burn up. And the only one I could get was a 60 amp. And I'm, I told my wife, I was like, look, we've been out here 20 years. We need to pay the electric company to fix this. Because there was a spell there where it we didn't have any heat in here when it was super, super cold. So we were all bundled up, fully dressed in winter wear, under the covers, sleeping that night. Anyway, I told her, so we have to do this. And so I asked the Lord, I inquired of the Lord, and I waited on him. And you know what he did? He actually, I forget what it was that had happened, but it was like a reimbursement check that had come in from something. And it was the amount of money we needed to pay for them to come out and put the bigger box on it, upgrade everything. Just pay it outright. The Lord provided us what we needed to be able to get this fixed. It's amazing. And, and I just have, have story after story after story of stuff like this in my personal life that has happened where the Lord has been right there. And it goes all the way back to my childhood, all the way back to when we were living in a, in a camper, an old bus that would belong to the Rose Bowl in Oklahoma and was converted to a hunting bus. And we were living in that on the beach. Um, we had a little, the old 66 Dodge van, camper van. Love that van. I'd love to find another one. That thing was so much fun. Uh, but we lived in that. I mean, all these stories, all the way back to when I was a kid of the Lord stepping in on our behalf. And when we waited on him, he provided everything we needed. Now, there was also a lot of examples about what we're talking about in the devotion here during that time frame of dumb decisions and things being done, not waiting on the Lord and seeing what he wanted to do. <clears throat> Which put us in a lot of those bad situations. The Lord has always been there. And, and I can only speak for my personal behalf. The Lord has always been there. The Lord has always stepped in. The Lord has always provided. The Lord has always... And even when I didn't act in faith, he was still there providing. Well, now at this point in my life, everything, my understanding has changed. Everything has changed. And I see more in the value or more value in stopping and waiting and walking in faith and watching for him. My wife was desperately wanted to buy another house. It was, it was a knee jerk reaction. Wanted to, she's tired of living here, wanted to move somewhere else. Well, I'm glad we didn't attempt to do that because the housing market went ballistic. A piece of property that a friend of ours owned, she sold it and moved to uh, Arizona to help take care of her mom. Um, she paid, I think, 399000 for it and sold it for 799000 same piece of property. And it was was not worth that much money. I saw lots of places started out like a hundred places we were looking at, 160,000 went up to almost 400,000 in the matter of a few months. And I'm glad, so I'm glad we didn't get involved in that. Number one, we wouldn't have got nothing for our place because nobody would have wanted to buy it at the price it would have been valued at. And number two, we couldn't afford to get into another $1,000 a month payment. And that's sort of the point I was trying to get to. The Lord stepped in. He put roadblocks every time she wanted to attempt to go try to look at something. It, it, it was shut down. And so the Lord was still there watching over us, taking care of us. And now what is he doing? He's providing us the ability to fix this up. He, he just Again, I can go story after story after story of the blessings of the Lord being poured out in these situations. When we go to him. And here's the point. And we wait on him. When we look to him, when we counsel with him, lean on the arm of God, it changes everything. And there's times where we may not even notice it until we stop and look really close and realize, wait a minute, this is the Lord working here. This is the Lord operating in this situation. Why are we going to constantly sit here and doubt and struggle and, and worry 
when we can't change the situation, let us go to the Lord. Let us lean on the Lord. Let us look to the Lord and wait on him because it may take a little bit of time, but I can guarantee you it'll be better than what you ever expected. It may not be exactly what you want, but it'll be most definitely exactly what you need. And it'll turn out better than what you realized. If you can just bring yourself to wait on the Lord, see what the Lord wants to do. Take counsel in him, go to him in prayer and ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do concerning this situation? I still have several petitions in the, in waiting and I'm waiting on the Lord to respond. And he will, I know he will because he has. And so I'm taking prior, uh, uh interactions as my witness that the Lord will respond. All I have to do is wait on him. If I can bring myself to that place, anyone can. If I can bring myself to that place of having patience and just patiently enduring and waiting on the Lord, everything turns out amazing. All we have to do is wait and watch and he will do a miracle right in front of our very eyes. Because he is worthy of our faith. He is worthy of us leaning on him, worthy of us going to him for help. Let us show him how worthy he is by looking to him and honoring him in that way. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory. And to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word and thank you for this devotion. It is an amazing thing to come to a place where you see, and I, I remember back when I was a kid seeing you work and knowing that it was you, even before I believed, even before I made my profession of faith, even before 1998, I knew it was you. And I always had an understanding of you. It was pretty elementary, but I could tell it was you. I, I, and I, there's times I wish that I would have come around sooner. But, you know, this went the way it went for a reason. I had to be tried in the fire. I had to be tempered. I had to be made different. And through all the life experiences, it came out that way. But I can see your hand working every single time, every single place, everywhere. Even in Iraq, I saw your hand working. It was time for two to come home, and you took those two home, those two NCOs that I knew. And it was amazing because in the incident, many of the housing units were destroyed, but only two of them were habited by those two you took home. When they should have been all filled. I've seen some out there where places were hit and nobody was there because they were all down at the MWR building. And they should have all been there. One word, the one landed within two inches of the front of the guy's door. And he was in his chew. And it was a big one. Where it had almost a two foot wide hole in the ground where it went in. Should have obliterated the entire chew block. And it didn't. And he was in there. Lord, I saw your hand working in so many things in our lives. The one that hit the middle of the road should have taken out three quarters of bandit troop. And we would have been sent home because our unit would have been decimated. And it didn't go off. Or it did go off, but it was underground. Amazing. Amazing. Story after story after story of your providence, of us waiting on you and looking to you and relying on you. And you come in and you work a miracle in our lives right in front of our eyes. Other people don't see it like that. I see it like that. I see it in amazing way. And so I start to see all these things that we deem as bad actually working out for our good, just like you said in the Bible. I forget who you were talking to now, but you were saying you meant it for evil. I mean it for good. And you take that evil situation and flip it around for our betterment, for our good, the good of those, for those who love you. Well, Father, thank you for working miracles in our lives, for showing us your strong arm, your hand working. Make us to have faith and wait on you. Make us to have faith and come to you with our requests first, and then see what happens. I think when we do that, we start to see even better things happen, even more incredible things happen.
Our problem is we don't think that it's something we should bother you with. And in reality, you tell us in your word, bring it all to me. I'm more than capable, more than strong enough, more than able. You have storerooms and treasuries beyond capacity to take care of anything that we need here on this earth. Why don't we bring it to you? Lord, make us to do this. Make us to stop and think about this. Make us to realize we need to come to you and tell you about these things and let you deal with these things. And what a miracle it works in our day. What a miracle it works in our day. To see your hand working and to walk in faith and believing and knowing. We have but to turn to you. And trust you. And believe you. For all that we need in this life and the next, in the lives of those we love and those around us. The most notable, the most recent is this vehicle we got for our mother-in-law. Lord, that, that, I knew that was you. They should have sold that car. That, sh that car should not be in the condition that it's in. It is an amazing deal that we got. That was all you. That was all you. amazing. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. Thank you for your providence and for being a strong arm for us to lean on in any situation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. I have story after story after story, testimonies out the wazoo of all of these instances throughout my life, all the way back to my childhood when the Lord acted and I knew it was him. Now looking back, I see him even more. But the only way you're going you're to notice those things is if you're watching. And if you're going to him with your problems and your issues and laying them at his feet, when you're tired and troubled, leaning on his arm. Because he is the only friend we need. And he is a friend indeed. In fact, he's closer than a friend. He's our father. Jesus is closer than a friend. He's our brother, our Lord, our Messiah, our high priest, our leader, our physician, our counselor. He is our everything. Let us go to him with all these things. And wait on him. Because what ends up happening is the greater glory comes from us waiting on him. The greater blessing comes from us waiting on him. And not just us receiving the blessing, but those around us enjoy the benefits of the blessings of our God. Amazing. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.